The Wilson memo and Oak Shannon's interview is the hot topic right now. I did my analysis of the interview by Project Unity where I found the work of Ferris Williams' theory of dynamics as a route to potential anti-gravitics, studied at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the 1980s, as well as implications for new routes to fusion energy. Grant Cameron then released alleged notes taken by Oak Wilson in 1985 during an informal working group to attempt to establish an advanced theoretical physics program. Rather than focus on the drama I'm going to focus on the science because I think that's what is truly important here. Grant removed the images quickly from Twitter, but they have been archived. Before I jump into my analysis I want to go over a few things that I think are very important. These notes are meaningless without proper context. We must find a way to establish a proper context and analyze the information with as little bias or preconceived notions as possible. The first thing we should look at is who was present at this meeting. Then we should look at the backgrounds of the people present especially at the time of the meeting and keep in mind the overall position of this subject at that time. This helps us create some context. Who is in the room and why? We also have a page that outlines the objectives and purpose so we must look at that before analyzing the personal notes of Shannon. Who was present? Oak Shannon of Los Alamos National Laboratory and a nuclear physicist. Bill Wilkinson of Unknown Background. McConnell of the NSA. John Alexander of Directed Energy Weapons Research and Paranormal Investigations with a degree in Sociology, PhD in Education and studied neurolinguistic programming under the 1st Earth Battalion. John apparently outs himself as the organizer of this advanced theoretical physics group in his book in 2011. Bert Stubblebein of BDM. Former INSCOM with Masters in Chemical Engineering and key sponsor of Project Stargate. Now VP of BDM Corporation which was a technical services firm founded in 1959 and bought by Ford Aerospace in 1988 while Stubblebein was still VP. He also consulted for Environmental Research Institute of Michigan which was started in 1946 as Willow Run Laboratories and contributed to the development of remote sensing, radar, and holography. He also contracted for Space Applications Corporation. He was inducted into the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame in 1990. Hal Putoff. Former NSA and PhD physicist that invented tunable lasers and started the remote viewing program that turned into Project Stargate, which was an espionage operation by its own admission. Jack Huick, Boeing engineer with degree in aerospace engineering and originator of the psychic parties or spoon-bending parties. Ed Speakman of Inscom. Instructor of physics in 1930s worked for Philco then Naval Research Lab in the 1940s. Was vice chairman of research and development board of DOD in 1949-52. Inscom since 1968. Bill Souter and Bob Wood of McDonnell Douglas Aerospace Corp. Ron Blackburn, Milt Janssen, and Don Kubel of Lockheed Martin. It appears the notes indicate a Superfund site. Okay, that's a lot to digest. Hopefully you looked over the attendees and their backgrounds. The next thing I want to do before digging into the content for analysis is propose a few assumptions. You'll notice the backgrounds of everyone known or either related to science, intelligence and or some kind of psychic stuff such as remote viewing. What I want to do now is propose we ignore the psychic stuff and the remote viewing stuff. Just filter it out. Why? I have a theory that the remote viewing stuff is used as cover for intelligence operations. This isn't meant to be a debunking or dismissal of psychic research or claims. It makes logical sense that remote viewing would act as perfect cover for intelligence sharing to protect methods and sources. It's also great obfuscation because it sounds absurd and can't be adequately explained. For example, a Soviet plane crashes and we want to retrieve it before the Soviets, but we don't want them to figure out who our man is on the inside with the intel. Well we make it look like we got the information from one of our psychic spies. This scenario actually happened as disclosed by Jimmy Carter. But how do the psychics get the information you ask? The answer is a combination of subliminal messaging, suggestion and techniques similar to neurolinguistic programming, NLP. A very good example of this kind of illusion can be demonstrated by the illusionist Darren Brown. Again, this isn't a debunking of remote viewing. The idea is that even if there is something to it, it's great cover. 
Maybe the results above statistical baseline was a few percentage points without this leaking, but they reached 60% by intentional leaking. In this scenario, the remote viewers likely would have no idea they are part of the leak. As long as Puthoff protects his sources, he has effectively created a human cryptography system. If you consider Puthoff was former NSA and many of the other people involved in the program were part of intelligence networks associated with espionage, this is a very rational explanation. If you think remote viewing is all bullshit, then you certainly should consider this theory as a likely explanation for the program which existed for decades and spent considerable resources. It makes more sense than fraud or incompetence. When we apply this theory as a filter and re examine the list of attendees, we can slash out all the psychic and remote viewing stuff, and we are left with purely scientific backgrounds or intelligence backgrounds specifically associated with espionage and psyops. Inskam being a particularly interesting one. Don't forget to check the show notes for more details. This filter we can now create can also be used in the opposing way where we ignore the science and only look at the people associated with the psychic stuff in order to identify the evolution of the mythology. For example, the mythology of an off-world craft and ET can be traced back from the Wilson memo, to the MJ-12 documents, and then back further to the Roswell mythology, and then further to the Philadelphia Experiment mythology, which interestingly paints a very long-running PSYOP program in which Morris K. Jessup may have been, Paul Benowitzid, or, driven to madness and suicide by bad actors, for publishing a book called, On UFOs, in 1955 in the middle of Project Blue Book when the Air Force was trying to convince the public UFOs were not real. Follow the wiki links in the show notes to better understand. Sorry if this turned into a tangent, but I do believe that it's important to acknowledge that the existence of psyops such as this have been proven to be real and not just a conspiracy theory and that they are a serious problem. Psyops on the public not only leads to ruining personal lives of individuals caught in the crosshairs, but it also drives rampant conspiracy theory in the public and distrust in our government and institutions. It undermines society as a whole and causes widespread mental illness. I once heard someone say, Either UFOs are real or we have a serious mental health crisis in our country. And I'd argue it's a case of both. UFOs are real and we also have a serious mental health crisis because of all the gaslighting. Another thing to consider is that this doesn't happen in a vacuum and that the UFO topic can also be used as cover for intelligence operations the same way remote viewing is. This means it intersects with counterintelligence measures and infiltration attempts by foreign adversaries as well. So not all odd things in ufology are necessarily the US government although this statement is not meant to absolve responsibility. This actually makes a strong case for why it's in the best interest for the US government to be more transparent on the UFO, UAP topic as it's become a driving force in undermining the very institutions and public it's supposed to be protecting. Another thing to consider when analyzing this meeting is that because of the people involved and the context of the situation, we can't rule out that the meeting itself is cover for some intel operation. We don't know what was discussed in that meeting exactly based off of these notes. We must begin our analysis with the type document stating the intro, objectives, purpose, etc. Then we can finally begin our analysis. I will not analyze every note, just what I deem interesting. The objectives state that they are exploring evidence to see if further study is warranted and if there is enough evidence to create an R&D program. If so, what should the thrust be? I find this wording interesting as it could be interpreted to mean they are most interested in figuring out the propulsion mechanism behind the alleged cases. The logical interpretation to this document is that they have identified potentially credible evidence of unknown craft that they would like to analyze if it's credible and figure out how to reverse engineer even if it's just theoretically. They also indicate desire to obtain more evidence if justified. It appears to be very exploratory, but when we consider these people are in a skiff environment with top security clearances and very scientific backgrounds and or high-level espionage, intelligence backgrounds it means we should take the cases that they have highlighted with some level of interest and credibility. The cases listed are Cash Landrum Iran F4 Woodbridge Brazilian Crash, Metal, Mike Neary, Photos, Paul T., First Hand Photos. 
Perhaps I will do a deep dive into these cases as another post. I will say that the Brazilian metal stands out to me as it's now fairly common knowledge to those of us paying attention that this is likely the magnesium sample that Dr. Gary Nolan has reported had anomalous isotopic ratios measured, and is still waiting to be confirmed by an independent analysis. They appear to acknowledge Blue Book was flawed in its analysis of the situation and that such a working group contradicts this. They bring up the Tunguska event as well. This event is very interesting as it happened in 1908 and has been determined to be a 12 megaton explosion in Russia. It's commonly interpreted as a meteor that exploded above the ground, but in an intro to one of Stephen Hawking's books I read as a kid I recall Hawking clearly stating that the event is actually quite mysterious and an example that we do not understand everything in physics. This chart is very interesting, but I want to direct your attention to the column on the right titled, Samples. It lists metal, soil, and red goo. We have heard of the magnesium sample and I've heard of soil samples that had radiation present, but what is this red goo? I recall Joseph Farrell discussing a rumored red mercury mixed with wax being used to power the dye Glock aka Nazi Bell. I'm hard-pressed to find a reliable source on that at the moment, though. 